first one is, why am I in Aboriginal education? And the second one is, why should we as educators be investing our time into Aboriginal education? These are two loaded questions. I think this begins with the idea of perspective. I think historically we look at the fact that due to lack of perspective, we've had a number of human atrocities, uh, civil rights violations throughout history. And I think if we look back on that, education and experience would have been a key piece of the puzzle to sort of remedy those situations. I think if you look at a guy like me, people often see an average white guy. People don't realize that I grew up on the fringe of the Fort William First Nation. And the reason I grew up there was because my dad's mill was right beside him on the Eye of Lake Superior. The perspective that I gained living in that environment was phenomenal. I had the opportunity to attend, attend school. Most of my classmates were First Nations. My sports teams were mostly First Nations. Uh, summer camp was First Nations. I attended powwows. I learned a little bit of Anishinaabe and, and Ojibwe. And I like to think that that's one of the reasons I'm working in Aboriginal education today. It's one of those pieces. I will also add that my mom was a, a social worker who worked for Ontario Aboriginal Housing and traveled to the Northern Reserves and would come home with those values and experiences. As a result, my sisters both became social workers. My, one of my sisters did her degree in Indigenous Studies and works in corrections. So those are my values, and I think those that's the perspective that has led to many of the decisions that I made today as the principal of Aboriginal education. And I still try to follow that listening and learning piece because it is very different out here in British Columbia. Having said all that, why are educators doing this right now? And I think it's, it's part of our trade that we ask those questions, especially considering that in many cases, what comes through education comes in and goes out. So why wouldn't that be the case with the first, first people's principles of learning? Is this something that's just going to come in and go, well, why should I change my practice? Well, first things first, I think we've got to learn from the past. We know that some of our most powerful civil rights activists, Nelson Mandela, Malala, around uh, women's rights, talked about education being the power. Okay, we know that. We know that this is a this is a time in history around Indigenous people. So is that enough for teachers? Well, we also know that people need different reasons to actually change. And so what I've done is I've put together a bunch of stats that I'm hoping will provide some of that leverage for people to, to look at why we actually need to change the foundations of education in order to support our students with Indigenous ancestry. So first things first, let's, let's look at the actual numbers. We only have about 1.3 million people in Canada that have ancestry. 4.2% of the population. Having said that, the demographic has grown by 20% compared to non-Aboriginal people, which is about 5.2% over that time period. Another interesting stat is the fact that over 50% of our people that have First Nations ancestry are living in poverty. And that number actually goes up to about 65% in the prairie provinces. We also know that the federal government has acknowledged that this is a staggering issue, that they are the most disadvantaged group in our country. Let's talk about children in care. Currently speaking, 8% of the ch our, our uh, total child population is Aboriginal, yet 55% of our children in care have ancestry. In our school district alone, we have 31 children right now in care, 19 of which are Aboriginal, which is 61%. I believe that's an interesting statistic that we need to look at. That ties back to that primary caregiver piece, and there's two stats up here that I'm looking at here. Canada check stats show that this uh, challenge uh, of single parent homes for Aboriginal families is twice as likely, and that children in the foster system who have ancestry are four times as likely to stay in that foster system. Mental health and suicide, I bring this up, this has been a recent situation in our school district, a young lady with ancestry. First Nations are twice the national average uh, at risk for suicide. Inuit students or children uh, are six to 11 times the national average. That ties into that mental health, ties into addiction. A survey was done around First Nations communities uh, across Canada, and three out of four people within those First Nations communities acknowledge that alcohol is an issue. One out of four said it's an issue in their home. One out of four also identified it as being an issue for themselves. Federal incarceration. 4% of our population is Aboriginal, yet 25% of our federal institutions are Aboriginal. In the current provinces, again, we're looking at one in two people who have ancestry in, in incarcerated. For women, it's even worse, and they're looking at it increasing to 40 to 50% in the, next, in the coming years. I took the PIB piece to sort of wrap this all up, and I took, the first one I took is local education. Out of 420 people in 2011 who had education, uh, who were adults, 36% had no education, all the way down to 4.8% had a university degree. That correlates and translates right into, into employment. Of those same 420 adults who were of labor age, there was 245 who were not in school or on disability. That had a 41.7% employment rate and a 30% unemployment rate who were actually claiming EI. 
So looking at all those, da those stats, I'm glad that politicians have kind of pushed this back into the education system. I'm really hoping that teachers are going to pull this onto their desks, teachers, administrators, because I think that the, the data stands for itself. We're in a time right now where we need to, to take advantage of this. And just to wrap it up, uh, a quote from Justice Murray Sinclair, who chaired the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He says, education is what has got us into this mess, which it is a mess, and education is going to be what gets us out of it. Thank you. My name is Dave. I'm going to be talking to you about why we put uh, inquiry into Law 12. Uh, and structure it this way, first of all, why we think about inquiry in Law 12, what's the structure of that inquiry look like, what's worked and hasn't worked, and where we're going next. Now, as a socials teacher at Penticton Secondary School, I'm used to students having to be dragged to my class. Um, <laughs> but I'm also sometimes in Law 12, they have to be dragged out of class. And this is sort of where the why comes from. Sometimes in Law 12, we give an assignment. It's a topic that students just get so engaged in. They just have to dig into it more than I'm giving them time to do. Classic example is the dreaded crime scene assignment. Kids love crime scenes. In Law 12, it's actually one of the assignments we're supposed to do. I give them a period to dig into crime scenes. and. I give them, you know, a little bit of time to, to fill through it, and you got one class chance to show me this kind of thing I'll get. You know, they've shown me different types of evidence. One of my top students, a girl named Maddie, she always got stuff in on time, always did a great job. So literally, I'm going, Maddie, you're a week later. You're two weeks later. That's you're a month late. And then I get an email. And this is only part of the piece that she has decided to create literally a crime scene and dig it back. And So inquiry made sense, but I'm a control freak. I don't want to let my grade 12s go where they want to go. I need some level of handle on this, so if they go out down those paths, what am I going to do? And I came up with an idea with uh, some of my colleagues to say, well, why not you know, track their notes and track, make those notes real, make them personal. And by personal, not just in their own words, but um, as they go down the path, how are you feeling if you do a capital punishment, if you read a, a, a quote somewhere or a, an idea? And how does that make you feel and where does it take you? And so we came up with a rubric to track those notes to try to make this more of a real process. And speaking of real, what was real learning? So I had to ask myself this question. When did I really feel like I was learning something? And it wasn't World Book. It was in those conversations I had after class at UBC. I loved my that those conversations I had with my friends at UBC. That's when I was really figuring things out. Not that dreaded World Book presentation. That sharing of that information. So how could I let my students share their inquiry? Not for assessment, but just that feeling of sharing and I wanted to create it but not lose my job. So how can I make that happen? And I decided, you know what, well let's set it up so that in class when they finish their inquiries, we have say four corners and students would go to a corner and they call it the topic and you go to whichever corner you want and you listen in. And um, I'd make it legal so I had Stevie's college money, we'd just buy coffee and donuts and we'd have a relaxed session there a couple of them at the end of the year. And boy did it ever work because uh, they would be in this corner talking capital punishment. Over here, a uh, girl talking about uh, a case that her about her own mom. And this is capital punishment. Kids love capital punishment. I don't know why. But they're just, their Curtis is the expert, but they're debating. They're just in there. They're loving it. You're going to see next Mr. Haithway. He's talking about becoming a cop. Um, and they're all, the, 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 the breadth of the topics, a uh, highway of tears, and then more importantly, the depth. They could dig. And it just worked so well. There it is. You know, it's actually got salary and benefits up on the screen. They're like, ah, oh, all right. Um, but then every once in a while, the topic they pick. Well, they love hockey fights, and want a couple of the boys. Ugh. And you know what? Hockey <laughs> fights make sense because there is a lot of criminality here. But this guy, he just went kept going to hockeyfights.com. And I had a buddy of his, and it wasn't working. And a buddy of his did the same thing, and I was like, oh, uh oh, what's going to happen? But he came back. And his was great because he had a good question. He found a question. He went, you know, when does violence become criminal in sport? And I thought, next year, how are we going to improve this? So I thought, what if we did a mini inquiry at the start? We picked uh, our first foundations unit and said, let's look at government. Let's look at Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Let's look at justice and morality. And I'll give the kids some directed questions, a little more specific, that they could choose or pick their own. The idea being that now maybe if we tried it first, if we do a bigger project at the end, we're not going to get off track too much. And the directed questions worked really well. I was really happy because one of my favorite questions, seven of them picked, and it was a great question, and it just pulled them along, was, 
is democracy really the best form of government? And considering the election to south of us right now, <laughs> how did they ever go there? And it was a good question that pulled in lots of great information. And so I'm happy with how the mini inquiries turned out, and now we've just headed out onto our larger inquiry for the end of the year. They'll be presenting it to me in a more formal area. They'll be sharing with each other. But those paths, I'm excited about, because that's the topics they're interested in. And then hopefully as they go down those paths, they'll develop the questions, and those questions will be deeper, engaging for them, their friends, and for myself. So that's where we're at with inquiry. So I'm Alicia Mora, and I'm here today to just share a story with you, and it's the story of my initial explorations with Applied Design Skills Technology, NESD, uh, which is new to elementary school. So it's a new curriculum for us that kind of popped up this summer. So first of all, there I am sitting at this conference this summer, and I'm looking at the grade one curriculum thinking about it. Like, holy crow, NESD, what is this? It just seriously popped up this summer. So, that's where my story began. What is this? So, opened up the curriculum document, took a look, found out that applied design skills and technologies at my grade level is the ability to design and make, acquire skills as needed, and apply technologies. Uh, okay. So I teach grade one. What does that look like with my sweet little turkeys? Yeah. Like, that seems pretty big for my little people, is what I was thinking. So then I started looking a little further and I started thinking about well, why are we doing this in elementary now? So I found out um, with ADST students can be given real life opportunities to develop a design mindset, to take on challenges, to persevere. Again, I teach grade one. Like, how does this fit with what I'm doing in my classroom? That seems quite large for my little people. And then I started thinking about, like, when am I going to do this now? I have another curriculum to add to my week. Like, how am I going to do this? I knew it couldn't be an add-on. Like, I can't add another block to my weekly schedule. So I started thinking, well, when do students already design and invent things in grade one? Okay, took a look at the big ideas in the curriculum. This is what they are. Skills can be developed through play. Okay, we do a lot of that in grade one. Uh, natural curiosity, definitely they've got that. Technologies or tools that extend human capabilities. Okay, we don't use a lot of tools in grade one, that's for sure. But uh, we have all this in the building center. So I realized this is exactly where kids are inventing and designing and creating. But then, how do I make that play with a purpose? How do I incorporate these curricular goals? So, I decided to take those found materials that I have in my classroom, put the materials in a van, so I like to organize things, <laughs> yeah. and give the kids a building challenge. Like, this is not new thinking, but this is how I can do this in my grade one classroom. So I printed out all these little pictures, and it's just different real life objects, and they're in those bins with those found materials, and of course, <laughs> You gotta have goals. So I looked at the curriculum and I thought, okay, what's the first thing that I want the kids to start practicing from this curriculum? So my first goal was I can share ideas and solve problems in a group. Okay, so that's what we're doing. So there they are. So one of the curricular competencies is ideating, so generating and choosing ideas. So they have to look at that set of challenges and they have to pick the one that they think will work well with the material they've been given. Then we have making. They actually go and make the product. So these kids looked at their base chem blocks and they decided they were going to try to construct a tunnel. And so that's what they're doing. They're working as a group and they're actually making the product after having generated their ideas. We also have sharing. So there's a couple of different ways we share um, our thinking in our classroom. Obviously drawn, right? That's one way that we do it. So this little guy says, I built a racetrack but it kept falling. I made it bigger at the bottom, is what he said. I also will videotape the groups, and again, thinking about the goal, they talk about the problems that they faced when they were building, and they talk about how they solved it, how they worked together. They're so cute, I love to see that. They're so sweet. So then, where am I gonna go next? So this is kind of the end of my story, and I'm thinking, there's a lot more curriculum, what am I gonna do? Well, what if we build products to solve problems? 
Or what if the whole class has a challenge and they have to like go out and find the materials? That'd be kind of cool. What if they design an, you name it, animal, building, invention? What if I start incorporating it in with my science and I think about the fact that students have been learning about animals and how those features of the animals are adapted to the environment? And so what if they design the ultimate animal based on the environment? And I just wanted to say, thinking about the core competencies and you know, how in the world do we fit those in with what we're doing, this is like all those core competencies. There's so much that it hits on, so there's a lot that we can do in ADST. And I just wanted to end with this. So there's a few resources that I used. Um, a few of them are off of TTBC, which is on the BCTF website. Um, and then there's one as well where it's a whole bunch of First Nations literature that um, can be used in ADST in a variety of ways from K-3. It builds up the anticipation. Okay, hello and welcome to the crappiest presentation that you are going to see tonight. <laughs> my presentation is entitled, The Lessons I Learned About Teaching While Potty Training My Willful Child. So Judith, if you don't mind pressing the over button, Oh, uh, let's start going now, just once. So let me start by telling you that I am not going to be winning Father of the Year Award this year, or anytime soon. Last March, my wife left on a 14-day tour of Europe with one instruction. Make sure Ethan is potty trained by the time I get back. <laughs> she travels to Europe, I get to potty train Ethan. Happy wife, happy life. Now I've run up in potty train. He was two and a half, and I figured it's going to be a snap. Wrong. It was the closest thing to a Mexican standoff that I have ever been involved in in my life. Well, fast forward to him being three. It's September now, and although he's P-trained, my efforts to fully train him have been a big number two. September <laughs> for teachers is stressful. September for a potty training failure of a father who knows he won't be winning Parent of the Year Award is even worse. From the immense reading I've done on potty training, I know that we have to be calm, the child has to be ready, but all that went out the window. I tried bribery, I tried chocolate, I tried marshmallows, nada. I then read that children have very little control in their life. They can control what they eat, where they sleep, or sorry, when they sleep, and if they poop or not. My son was fully exercising his right not to defecate where I wanted him to. <laughs> now, there are a lot of types of poopers. My son is a high pooper. We know that if he has to go, all of a sudden our house gets quiet and we can't find him. So then it becomes a frantic game of hide and seek and catch the pooper. My wife checks behind the couch, I check the hedges, we check all the doors. Now September, our stress level has already ramped up as teachers, and all of a sudden I heard the front door quietly open and close. I clambered for it like a leopard on its prey. As I swung it open, Ethan was in squat position, on our doorstep, in his underwear, going, No dad! Go dad! <laughs> I lost my cool. I picked him up and he beat me with the fury only a three-year-old can muster, and I tore off his pants and I planted them on the body in the washroom and I said, Go poop now! No dad! My wife said, don't engage in a power struggle. I snapped back, I'm not in a power struggle. As I held my son's shoulders, I locked eyes with him and I said, poop now. <laughs> <laughs> he got quiet and he peed. At this point I thought, I gotta be wrong. Maybe he just had to pee. At this point, he stood up, he grabbed the potty full of urine and he threw it at me. <laughs> Covered in urine and filled with rage, I chased him as he ran into his room, slammed the door and said, no dad, go dad. My wife very helpfully chimed in, don't get into a power struggle. Dripping in urine, I responded, I need your support right now. <laughs> I put the potty on the floor and I grabbed Ethan, and at this point, he began to defecate mid-air as I swung him across our hardwood floors on the potty. He landed, and a deer-sized pellet landed in the toilet. Huffing and puffing, I looked at my wife, and I celebrated by saying, I won. <laughs> Her response, the floor is covered in feces and you're covered in piss. I think you lost. <laughs> With the help of a consultant, and yes, there are actually consultants for this, we developed a picture book starring Ethan and his potty. We read it once and he started pooping regularly, sorry about the pun, in expected locations. Now reflecting on my experience, there's a good reminder about being a teacher. Students and the teacher both have to be ready for the experience. We have to scaffold it, but we also have to take into account different learning styles. Ethan, he needed pictures and all I was using was words. We also have to learn not to get frustrated and think outside the box. Now potty training also offers new uh, lessons on the new curriculum. It's gonna allow us to slow down, to use alternate methods to engage our students. It also reminds us that some students aren't there yet, but we gotta remember that that's the operative word. Now we gotta be cognizant that understanding will eventually come for our students like Ethan. 
and we may just need to state open to alternative methods. Picture Books for Pooping, starring Ethan, has been a fan favorite in our house. What tool or outside the box thinking are you going to use to reach your students? Now, I failed to win Father of the Year award, but I was reminded through my crappy experience that there are a few things I need to remind myself about teaching. Number one, the new curriculum is going to be tough, but let's just start. Number two, school does not promote success in all students. The approaches afforded by the new curriculum are ethically and morally a lot better than what we have now. Number three, coercion doesn't work, and we've got lots of coercion in our system. Just Google uh, school makes me and see what comes up. Students learn at different rates, so let's honor that. The new curriculum offers us a chance to look at our whole child. Please don't judge Ethan based on his body training or his genetics. <laughs> we need to go out and we need to create a better system. One for our students, that's better for our students and us. But I want to warn you, there are days we're not going to be successful. We're going to do a crappy job. What we have to remember is that we're doing this hard work for a really important reason. It's that every kid in the world needs a better system. So let's look at every day in our class as an opportunity to do the most creative for ourselves and for our students. Because we have a whole generation of young kids growing up who actually need better from us and from our system. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks.